Well, good evening and welcome to SAR. I'm Cynthia Chavez Lamar, director of the Indian Arts Research Center. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. It's going to be a great night because you'll all be very warm in this room. <laughs> In the last three months, Will Wilson has been hard at work on his critical indigenous photographic exchange, which focuses on depicting contemporary native artists and art professionals through 19th century photographic techniques. In this photographic exchange, Will intends to supplant Edward Curtis's settler gaze with a contemporary vision of native North America. In between taking photographs of many people, including SAR staff and residents on campus, Will has been extremely busy presenting at several symposia, including Modernist Encounters in Contemporary Inquiry, Art Appropriation and Cultural Rights, co-sponsored by SAR and the O'Keeffe Museum, Rethinking New Mexico Art, The Great Debates, Fusion, Inclusion, Exclusion at the New Mexico Museum of Art, and at the 2013 Native American Art Studies Association Conference. He currently has his photographs on exhibit at the Maxwell Museum through January 31st. So if you get an opportunity, please go by the Maxwell. And he recently spent three days photographing individuals on UNM's campus. Will's work has been featured in prominent exhibitions and collections nationwide. In addition to his fellowship at SAR, he has been honored with the Idol Jorg Fellowship for Native American Fine Art Joan Mitchell Foundation Award for Painters and Sculptors, and a Native American Arts and Cultures Foundation Fellowship. As he leaves SAR, he will be preparing for an exhibit of his palladium, platinum palladium prints at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, which will open in June 2014. With that, please welcome Will Wilson, the 2013 Rollin and Mary Ella King Artist Fellow. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, and thank you to SAR and to all you folks for coming. Um, it's been a pleasure and it's been just, you know, an amazing time for me to focus on, on different projects and organize and, and create. And so, you know, it's, it's a remarkable opportunity. Also, thank you to my fellow fellows. It's been wonderful to hear kind of all of your kind of inquiry and your hard work and, and you know, it's been inspirational to kind of come to these talks and see what goes on here. Um, and uh, I should also give a big thank you to my family, um, Carla Contupis, as she may come this evening, um, and my, my wonderful children, Zoe and, um, and Joaquin, who in another way have totally enabled this, this practice. <laughs> um, so, to them. Um, so I'm Will. I, I was born in San Francisco and uh, kind of lived between that space and, and Tuba City, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, kind of moving back and forth. Uh, my clan's Kia'ani and uh, I was born uh, for an Irish and Welsh man. Um, so Kia'ani and Shlito Belagana Yashashin, but because I don't know how to say Irish and Welsh, so <laughs> in Navajo anyway. And um, so uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to read a little bit uh, and maybe scroll through some images just to kind of give you a contextual kind of frame for my work and what I'm going to do. And then I'll move into a PowerPoint that kind of gives a broader kind of uh, introduction to, to my practice, right? Um, so Speaking to the importance of the expressive arts for historically subjugated peoples, author and cultural critic Bell Hooks has noted how we work to connect art with lived practices of struggle. Constituting a genealogy of subjugated knowledges, we provide a cultural location for the construction of alternative readings of history told from the standpoint of the oppressed, the disinherited, or those who are open to seeing the world from this perspective. Uh, concurrently, we enable the articulation of cultural practices that are part of the reality of marginalized groups, not forged in the context of struggle. Um, the assertion of a decolonized subjectivity allows us to emphasize resistance as well as other aspects of our um, experience. Um, so that's, <clears throat> excuse me, bell hooks. Um, 
So this observation is a good place to start when considering the work um, in cross currents, which I will mention in a second. Um, and it's particularly poignant for understanding the issue of cultural appropriation or misappropriation as it pertains to contemporary native art practice in the 21st century. Uh, as Hooks writes, part of our project is encoding material with stories drawn from alternative readings of history that often emphasize resistance, but are also simply about who we are. Um, so this process is at once remarkably complicated and sublimely simple and uh, almost always mediated by our struggle and play with cultural misappropriation. Um, so those are, that's the opening kind of to this catalog essay that they asked me to write for this exhibition that is in Denver that it's going to open this uh, next weekend called Cross Currents, and, and I'm in it with a number of other uh, artists. So um, it's also kind of a good, I think, stepping off point to talk about um, the, uh, the critical indigenous photographic exchange, um, which is this work that I'm doing now, and, and is what has kind of brought me to um, SAR and, and this kind of practice that I've been doing. Um, I'll read a little bit about that in a second, but just generally, um, this is a good example. Um, so this is George Horse Capture, um, and if you can read that title. Uh, at, the mo at that time, he was a, um, a curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and so this whole project started in 2002 during Indian Market. Um, and Joe came, and I, and I had heard of him, but I didn't know him, um, and he asked if he could sit and collaborate on this project, and he sat down and he said, hey, is, is your iPad, is, is that working? And I said, yeah, and, and so he, he said, let me, let me have it. And so he brought up this image of his great, great, great grandfather, uh, Horse Capture, who was photographed by Edward Curtis. So it's a little bit hard to read in this image, but that's Horse Capture on the iPad that, that Joe is holding, and he's, and he's got a rifle because he's representing himself as a warrior. Um, and Joe said, you know, this is very kind of um, convenient because, you know, I'm, I'm a curator and I deal with knowledge and representation, and, and this is my way to manifest the fact that I am a warrior today. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways this, this one image kind of encapsulates the whole project. I mean, it's a pretty simple, straightforward kind of idea. Um, there's the legacy of Curtis and responding to that. Um, and then there's also this kind of, uh, I think, just general love of photography and, and creating like imagery. Um, and also about, I think, the kind of exchange that goes on between a sitter and a, and a photographer when you make these, these you know, beautiful images, hopefully. Um, and so I've been thinking about that in terms of relational aesthetics. Um, and then in my case, those relational aesthetics happen on top of kind of a sub, subtext of, of relational antagonisms, <laughs> historical <laughs> relational antagonisms. Um, so, I mean, I think that's enough. <laughs> that's enough to keep me doing this project for the rest of my life. I, I really love it. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, I learn, you know, something really unique about each individual that I kind of work with. Uh, the exchange part of it is that I gift the sitter um, the actual tintype that I'm making, which is this really unique one-off like form of photography. It was actually the second photographic process invented, and it supplanted the daguerreotype almost overnight. For a number of reasons, um, the inventor didn't patent it, <laughs> which, which led it to spread very quickly. It also is a lot easier to do than making a daguerreotype. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a really easy kind of forgivable process as well. So um, it's kind of wonderful to be in a dark room again doing that. Um, so maybe I'll read a little bit of this. So that's Joe. Let me go back here just so you can see some more of these images. This is Kevin Gover, who is the uh, director of the National Museum of the American Indian. This is Terence Houle, who's a performance artist, First Nations performance artist from Canada. Um, Nicholas Galanin, who just uh, was awarded an Idle George Fellowship, 
uh, as, as well as I think a big creative capital grant. Um, the, the man on your invitation, uh, Nakota Lawrence, uh, is an incredible hoop dancer and dancer in general. Um, he's a six time world champion hoop dancer. Uh, Cirque du Soleil saw him perform and they actually choreographed a piece around his, his presence and performance. And he, for a number of years, he toured with them. Uh, he's also part of a, a, a locally based international indigenous dance troupe run by Rulan Tanjin called uh, Dancing Earth, Indigenous Dance Creations. And so um, I had the opportunity to photograph that troupe as they were preparing for a kind of world premiere of, of a performance that they did at the Lenzik last year. Um, these dancer images come from that. This is Zig Jackson uh, with Andrew Smith in the background kind of shielding his soul. Um, <laughs> and, and Zig is well known for taking pictures of, of white people, taking pictures of Indians. And so we're kind of having this face off <laughs> photographically. Um, he's a professor of photography at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, <laughs> so, and a fellow UNM grad. Um, so as an indigenous artist working in the 21st century, employing media that range from historically photographic, historical photographic processes, um, to the randomization and projection of complex visual systems within virtual environments, I'm impatient with the way that American culture remains enamored of one particular moment in a society, or one particular moment um, in a photographic exchange between Euro-American and Aboriginal American societies. The decades um, from 1907 to 1930, when uh, Edward Curtis, photographer Edward Curtis, produced his magisterial opus, The North American Indian. Uh, for many, even today, Native people remain frozen in time uh, in Curtis's photographs. Other Native artists have produced photographic responses to Curtis's oeuvre, um, usually using humor as a catalyst to melt the lacquered romanticism of these stereotypical portraits. I seek to do something different. I intend to resume the documentary mission of Curtis from the standpoint of a 21st century indigenous trans customary cultural practitioner. Um, and I want to supplant Curtis's settler gaze um, and the remarkable body of ethnographic material he compiled with a contemporary vision of Native North America. Um, I'm going to skip to the end here. So ultimately, I want to ensure that the subjects of my photographs are uh, participating in the reinscription of their customs and values in a way that will lead to a more equal distribution of power and influence in the cultural conversation. It's my hope that these Native American photographs will represent an intervention within the contentious and competing visual languages that form today's photographic canon. Um, so, this indigenous photographic exchange will generate new forms of authority and autonomy. Um, these alone, rather than the old paradigm of assimilation, can form the basis for a reimagined vision of who we are as Native people. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is the, is the, the project um, that brought me here. I, I should thank Bruce Bernstein um, for kind of kicking me to initiate this. It's kind of been a dream and stuff. And also Andrew Smith, uh, who runs, a, he's a local uh, photography dealer who has an amazing collection of images. But um, Bruce and Andrew Smith approached me about um, curating a uh, photography exhibit of contemporary indigenous photograph photographers during Indian Market in 2012. Um, at the last minute, we lost the space that would enable us to kind of have the show. Um, but then there was this necklace, the friendship necklace, uh, which 13 different jewelers um, created and donated to, to SWIA, the organization that runs Indian Market, um, just to say thank you. And um, they needed an image for, for the cover of the Indian Market magazine. And, and my studio here in Santa Fe happens to be around the corner from a company called Bostick & Sullivan that for the last 30 years has been keeping kind of vernacular and historic photographic processes alive because they've created the chemistries. Um, and so I said, well, I've been dying to try this wet plate process. 
if you get me the chemistry for a, you know, to do some images, I'll go. And so this is the very first, this one right here, uh, wet plate that I ever made. And, and, and um, that was in 2012, sometime probably in July. Um, so it's, it's really easy <laughs> um, <laughs> and fun. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and just talk more generally about kind of some of my other work. Um, this is a project that I've been working on since 2005, and um, it's entitled Autoimmune Response. Um, and so since 2005, I've been creating a series of artworks entitled Autoimmune Response, which takes as its subject the quixotic relationship between a post-apocalyptic Navajo man played by me, uh, <laughs> and the <laughs> devastatingly beautiful but toxic environment that he inhabits. Um, the series is an allegorical investigation of the extraordinarily rapid transformation of indigenous lifeways, um, the disease that that has caused, and strategic uh, responses that enable cultural survival. So the, last the latest iteration um, from this series um, Let's see. The last iteration of the autoimmune response series uh, features the installation of a, a Hogan greenhouse um, entitled the Autoimmune Response Research Facility. So here are the characters building the, well, he's building a Hogan, so, you know, traditional Navajo architectural form um, that he's kind of found and it's become his lab and now he has to create his own version of it. Um, and so this was actually in 2000 at the Heard Museum in Phoenix. Joe Baker was the curator at that point, and he invited me to kind of put this together. Later, the National Museum of the American Indian took it to New York, um, and I kind of had a concurrent uh, exhibition with... Um, um, he was kind of in the next bay over. Um, and so the Autoimmune Response Research Facility now... Um, well, here's a few more images of me making it. There's a weaving aspect to it. So this is the, the latest version of it, um, the greenhouse part. So this facility um, was accompanied by a, a, a set of large photographs. So, you know, those photographs are, are pretty large in scale. They're about four by ten feet long. Um, so they're kind of expansive in, in the way that you kind of are presented with them. But um, it's also about kind of cultivating indigenous food species. And so, you know, wherever these things land and set up, I kind of do some research about heirloom variety seed, indigenous food species. I've done this at the Navajo Nation Museum Zoo. I've done it at the Denver Botanical Garden here in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Art Institute. Um, and in each place, it kind of serves as an incubator for a different uh, set of uh, crops, right? Because, um, you know, if you're facing the apocalypse or the post-apocalyptic world, you, you have to eat. Um, and so he's growing food in order to do that. And with, I think, the eventual kind of goal of, of terraforming, kind of like bringing back um, these, these species to the world. Um, I would love for this to kind of expand and jump from kind of the art practice to the social practice on a broader scale. Um, I was at the Bioneers Conference recently and kind of made some connections and started to get the idea or like put the pieces together to pitch the idea uh, to create this. Maybe in Fort Defiance, there's... Um, the Navajo Forestry Department has some greenhouses where they're cultivating fast-growing ponderosa to reseed a section of the Chuska Mountains near Sawmill that were poorly managed and kind of clear-cut. And there's a man named AKR Bob there who's been doing this. And, you know, we've kind of struck up a friendship. And he's kind of, over the years, um, he's been there for 20 or 30 years, set up his own kind of botanical garden. And it happens to be right next to the Fort Defiance High School. So all the pieces are kind of in play, I think, to kind of generate something like this. I mean, this is me visioning the dream of, of this kind of scale of cultivation because the Denver Botanical Gardens allowed me to use their, their greenhouses as kind of a, a prop or a backdrop, right? So, um, 
So this is a shift, uh, big dream, social engagement. Um, this is a mural that I did in, in, in Tucson, Arizona, um, and it is uh, entitled The Barney to Mural Project, and I did it with my friend Josh Serentitis, uh, who's this amazing muralist who's done stuff all over the country, um, most notably in Philadelphia, where he's been part of the mural arts program there. Um, so, this is actually about 360 feet long and 20 feet high, and it's a photograph made of glass. Um, so we developed this software that enabled us to kind of map pixels. And in our case, our pixel is a three-quarter inch square of glass. Um, and so when you aggregate a million of these, <laughs> you get um, 400 square feet, or 4,000 square feet, excuse me, um, of of these tile panels that mosaic together and start to create an image of a community. So we spent a year in community in the neighborhood kind of developing oral history projects, we taught people photography, we gathered historical images. Um, so everybody imaged in the mural is actually from the community of Barrio Anita in Tucson. Uh, there's Mr. V, Mr. Valenzuela, who's kind of a seminal figure in the mariachi community in, in Tucson, which is like this kind of important source of cultural pride for you know, uh, the Latino population. Dr. Laura Banks in the background, who was you know, an unwed mother in the neighborhood, dropped out of school, went back to college, became the, super in, the, the, the assistant superintendent of the Tucson Unified School District, and eventually, was important in desegregation uh, in, in Tucson. So she's a local hero. Um, and so we, you know, we envisioned all of these kind of heroic figures from the community and wanted to tell their story um, in grand scale. That's La Llorona. This is Frank Soto and his grandmother. They're actually a Chiricahua Apache, and she was a, a healer in the neighborhood. And then there's a Corandera, um, just locally. This is us actually doing the installation. Uh, it took us three years altogether. This is a cautionary tale about public art. <laughs> so this is our, our design that we came up with and we thought was gonna be this beautiful narrative about this mother honoring her b-boy son who was nearly blind but was winning competitions internationally and so she tattooed the um, image of the Aztec fire god's rattle on her wrists and and the neighborhood saw those, and there was a lot of gang violence in the neighborhood, and all they could see was gangs. You know? So they shot that idea down very quickly. Um, instead, this is the, the actual mural that was produced. Um, and it became more about this guy, Dr. Father Braun, who was a Franciscan priest who kind of enabled the community to build this St. Mary's kind of parish or church in their neighborhood. Um, so this is, this is in Philadelphia, and this was produced in our studio in Tucson. Um, and this is a kind of tile pile, that's the name of the software that we designed, 2.0. So more colors, better integration of kind of tonal range and stuff. Um, so the Josh Serentitis was the lead on this, and he got a big grant from Lincoln Financial to produce this mural, another uh, million mural pixel project, or million pixel mural project. Um, and so it was supposed to have some relation to Abraham Lincoln. And there is text from the Emancipation Proclamation, but it's entitled Legacy, and it's really about the legacy of slavery in the United States. Um, but it's also about kind of honoring this, this young, you know, beautiful African-American woman in a town that is, you know, largely African-American and kind of, you know, creating that, like, reifying, culturally proud image for all to see in an urban space. Um, so lately I've been playing with these things, these QR codes and trying to figure out, you know, like new media kind of forms of communication. Um, this is a short video that I might speed up actually. So do you guys know about the obelisk in the center of the square, you know, and somebody's kind of made this intervention and chiseled out the word savages, right? So 
A few blocks away is this obelisk in front of the federal courthouse. Um, and it's actually a monument to Kit Carson. Um, and so this is kind of me counting coup on that, on that uh, obelisk. <laughs> I have dreams about actually chiseling the QR code into, into the side of it, but who knows, we'll see. Um, I think there's two. So that's the website it leads you to. And then on that website, there's a video. get the point. <laughs> um, oops. So I'm kind of fascinated with that. The, with, I, don't, I guess the term is augmented reality. Um, <laughs> and, and so that led to this project. Um, and, and hopefully, if, if you have time, you'll come over with me to the studio and, and you can actually see this piece. So we've, we took that same uh, software that we designed to make that really large scale <coughs> photographic image and we downscaled it. Uh, and in this case, our pixel was a three quarter inch square of glass. So this is a collaboration with, um, oh, it was uh, actually commissioned uh, by New Mexico Arts, but um, it was also a collaborative project. Um, Joy Farley, Pamela Brown, Jamie Smith, Dylan McLaughlin, and myself kind of in, dreamed this whole thing up and, and, and created it. And so we took a rug that my grandmother, Martha City, had woven about 35 years ago um, and translated it into a glass weaving with these pixels. Uh, that's Joy and her sister Pam. Um, who, you know, grew up weaving. Uh, they're from the Two Gray Hills region. Um, <coughs> but the one thing we changed was we embedded the QR codes. And so the QR codes lead to... Oh. Will lead to... I'm actually going to show you this from a different media source because it resolves better. Uh, so I'll come right back to that in a minute. And uh, let's see. So this is my website, which is something that I was able to accomplish while here at SAR and at the IARC. So thank you very much, because I desperately needed to put this together, and I was able to. Um, so these are some other weavings. These all correspond to the four sacred colors of the Navajo. Um, and these QR codes lead you to my post-apocalyptic Navajo guy at the sites of those mountains doing his thing. Uh, but this rug in particular is the one that we were talking about. Um, and I'll just show you another kind of short video. These are the videos that those other ones link to. But Dylan McLaughlin did this. Oops. And, uh, Oh, no, can you know? What's on, 
I just have one other thing that I'd like to read. It's something I read recently. Um, uh, Rebecca Solnit, who's one of my favorite writers on photography, wrote this. And, and it's something that I think kind of informs me as I kind of create these historic, well, these images of present day with a historic medium. Um, so there's a romantic tradition of looking at ruins in which the crumbled remains of what once was mighty produces a satisfactory sense of the unstable and fleeting nature of power, a tradition of looking after the event. Um, images before the event, before the occasion of power, possess another sense of instability in which other outcomes are still possible. Images in which we can see the raw material of our own destinies before they have taken form. The present is the fruit of tiny events, each one decisive, each one eliminating the countless other presents that might have been. And a photograph of the past is a photograph of a time at which those outcomes were yet indeterminate. So thank you very much for coming, listening. We hired like 10 people and we have them working 10 hours a day for 14 days. We've made it 14 days, which is crazy. <laughs> but, um, we had a This actually is a commission. It belongs to uh, New Mexico Arts, Art, and Public Places, but they've allowed me to. I just got it back from an exhibition. It's been it's been exhibited almost like since it was made. And so it brings. I mean, it's good for them and it's good for me. 